Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. We are keeping an eye on the coronavirus pandemic. The outbreak in East Asia has calmed down so far. One thing that is helping these countries monitor the spread of the virus is tracing travel information of its residents. Local governments are asking citizens to scan two digit codes on their phone to report their whereabouts to decide whether they should go into quarantine. Big data has many disease control applications. Professor Ya Sheng Huang has kept an eye on these developments. As a professor of political economy and international management from MIT, he gave his opinions about collecting travel information and some privacy concerns generated by this measure. Earlier, I invited him for a detailed discussion. Take a look. Professor Huang, you've been talking about the digital contact tracing taking place in East Asia and how is it interacting with the process of uh, COVID-19. Uh, tell me more about how exactly it is playing a role. Well, it is a playing a very important role because digital contact tracing enables policymakers, medical professionals, and also just average people to determine and decide on um, the degree of their exposure, potential exposure to COVID-19, mm -hmm. and then decide on that basis of information what to do next. Uh, it is a very, very valuable tool in uh, responding to COVID-19. Yeah. And I believe that East Asian societies and countries have shown a example of how to use that technology to deal with a public health emergency. Can you give us some examples to, in a way, demyth the practices in East Asia? Well, it, it has been applied in China, in South Korea, and in Singapore. And the basic idea is that uh, you download the app, you enter information into the lab, into the app mm -hmm. about your travel history, about your own medical and personal uh, conditions, and then you use the Bluetooth to uh, communicate with other people who also have the app. The biggest difference is that in the United States, the app is relatively limited. Uh, it is not integrated with other database um, and it relies on self-reporting completely. Whereas in East Asia, uh, the database is integrated with other types of data. Mm. The other big difference is the scale and the speed of adoption. In the United States, this is a private sector effort. It depends on voluntary uh, opt-in by the users, so the, ski, uh, uh, the speed of our adoption and the scale of our adoption is relatively limited as mm -hmm. compared with East Asia, where you have this integration not just between different databases, mm -hmm. but also between government and business. So the adoption rate in East Asia is much faster and the scale is much larger. Yeah. In a pandemic which, where things are happening so fast, uh, how important is the speed? This has to do with the fact that COVID-19 is highly contagious. And when you have such a highly contagious outbreak, essentially, if you don't have universal contact tracing, you have none of contact tracing. Mm -hmm. Even if you leave one person out, or two persons out, or three persons out, it can defeat the purpose. So nearly universal adoption, um, you know, I'm not talking about 100%, but maybe 80%, 90%, is really necessary to deal with the COVID-19. But also, it has to be balanced with a lot of different factors, for example, cultural factors in Confucian societies, probably the tendency of accepting, you know, states uh, demand is different compared to where you are in the United States. And also there's the issue of privacy as well. How do you see privacy in a time of crisis? Uh, absolutely. This is an important question and we shouldn't um, 
uh, just emphasize uh, one set of values at the expense of the other. But my own view is that uh, in an emergency situation, mm -hmm. some values are more important than other values. Mm -hmm. In a normal time, we can talk about the trade-off, you know, which set of values we should emphasize, which set of values we can kind of put aside. Right. In a public health emergency situation, I believe public safety is value number one. And you have to be willing mm -hmm. to give up um, some of the privacy concerns for the sake right. of public safety. Yeah, but Professor, just for argument's sake, I mean, um, you know there's a Chinese phrase which is called shi hou zhu liang, meaning everybody could be a grand sure. strategist after everything becomes, you know, clear. Yeah. Uh, so it is a tricky thing for the policymakers, particularly in different societies and cultures, to decide at a time when not everything is clear yet, uh, that they do not necessarily know it's likely to be a pandemic. How would you interpret this uh, critical choice and what we could learn this time for the next time? Well, okay, so two, two, two responses. One is that now we know this is a pandemic. Yes. A pandemic. We know this is a public health uh, emergency. And I believe in this particular situation, we need to put uh, privacy concerns um, in some proper perspective vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis public safety, right? Yes. The second thing I want to say is that, in fact, if you look uh, at the countries around the world, uh, all have thought about what you do in the case of emergency. It could be a public health emergency, it could be a military emergency, mm -hmm. it could be some, some, some other type of emergencies. During that moment, you need to change your system in order to respond to that particular situation. Mm -hmm. In Israel, they have suspended certain uh, individual rights to deal with COVID-19. For the United States, public health emergency has not been a something that, that, that people often think about, they think about terrorism, they think about nuclear weapons and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I think we should begin to think about public health emergency as one of the most severe situations that we have to deal with. Apart from detailed measures on tracing the spread of COVID-19, Professor Huang also mentioned some other important factors that have affected the performance on disease control in different countries. He pointed out that with the completely different economic and political experiences, what works in China may not be compatible elsewhere. And these uneven measures are affecting global efforts in combating the pandemic. Professor Huang, another right. thing has a lot to do with uh, people's experiences. One, if you look at China, uh, 2003, and some of the East Asian economies experienced the SARS, and that was a devastating situation, lives lost overnight. Uh, how much does it have to do with our past experiences of dealing with crisis? And uh, the narrow escape from now on, how should we understand that phrase? Does it still exist anymore? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a very good uh, question. The East Asian countries had the experience of SARS, which had a very high mortality rate, mm. and 10% of people died. Um, and, but as a result, it was not that contagious. It didn't spread to many countries. The COVID-19 has a different uh, profile. It is more contagious. Uh, far more contagious than SARS, but because the mortality rate is not that high, uh, you don't have the kind of situation when many people show up in the emergency rooms in the hospital yeah. simultaneously. And that was the scenario that scared uh, people in China during the SARS and obviously in Wuhan during COVID-19. Mm. Western countries uh, haven't had a type of experience, and I think that partially explains why the responses in the West 
have not been terribly proactive uh, because their instinct is th this is something remote, this is something distant, yeah. this is not something that uh, that they have to deal with. Right. Yeah, but they should not be used Sorry? as excuses not to act for now, particularly. D definitely not for next time. Uh, <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. But I would argue that it's not just lack of experience. Um, by now, every uh, indicator that we have is that in January, they were already pretty solid warnings within the United States. Mm. about a potentially dire situation in the United States if they didn't put in effective controls. There were voices coming from private sector, from academia, from newspapers, mm -hmm. from uh, one of the uh, presidential candidates, uh, Joe Biden. There were also warnings from within the Trump administration and memos and, and um, briefings by right. the Secretary of Health, uh, um, uh, Azar, um, but still there were no effective actions taken by the Trump administration. So I believe that it was also a gigantic failure of leadership. I see. It was not just lack of experience, there was all the information they needed to take actions, and they didn't. Mm. Professor Huang, before we go, tell me more about your assessment. How is this COVID-19, as far as we know it, likely to play its role about the current thinking of globalization and the global supply chain, as well as you know some of the most important geopolitical relationship, including that between China and the United States? I think we just have to accept the reality within the short run, the U.S.-China relations are going to be worse rather than going to be better. I'm just stating the obvious. I'm not saying anything that other people don't know. This is an election year in the United States. The Republican Party has a strategy of blaming the failures in the United States in terms of dealing with COVID-19 um, on China. And my own view is that uh, whatever uh, the issues are within China, uh, it has nothing to do with the response, the, the, the lack of effective response by the United States. The reason is very simple. South Korea, Germany, Israel, and Hong Kong and Singapore, they all rely on the same information from China as the United States did. Mm. Right? These countries have done a pretty good job. Right? South Korea is really fantastic job. Right. So you cannot really blame the problems in the United States on information from China. In terms of global supply chain, uh, the trade war has already affected the global supply chain. COVID-19 is another gigantic negative shock to global supply chain. There is going to be deglobalization. Countries are probably going back to their own economies and try to produce <clears throat> lots of things within their borders. I don't believe this is the right response. Uh, I believe this is a costly response to the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I believe globalization can actually provide a solution, but it has to happen under better governance standards, under better governance norms. Mm -hmm. And that's, so these are the two directions of the debate, deglobalization and doing globalization better yes. and smarter. I will support the second option. We hope that will be the case. But for now, I want well, to thank like you. For your insights and input, uh, Professor Ya Sheng Huang from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, sir. Be well. Back. Let's turn to the U.S. Two people with the coronavirus died in California as much as three weeks before the U.S. reported its first death from the disease in late February. That means a gap 
may have led to delays in issuing a stay-at-home orders in the nation's most populous state. So far, the U.S. COVID-19 cases and deaths have surpassed all other countries. Though the curve has been flattened, the challenges for the U.S. in combating the pandemic remains. So how should the world's largest economy cope with the next phase? We invited Dr. Eric Rubin, editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, for his insights from a scientist's perspective. So we invite uh, Dr. Eric Rubin, editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Rubin, what a pleasure to see you once again. Nice to see you virtually. It's good to find you safe and sound after one week of heavy work in the clinic. But tell me more, Dr. Rubin. Your assessment of the latest number, both confirmed and death cases inside the United States, it seems to be quite a huge number. It's a huge number. It's overwhelming. And it's meant that in areas where, where there are a lot of cases, a bit reminiscent of parts of China, uh, it's been it's taken over the hospital systems. So, for example, in Boston, where I am, where we do have a lot of cases, the hospitals are filled with COVID-19 patients and essentially empty of everything else. But what does that mean? Because uh, if you compare the number of confirmed cases in the United States and that of China, there's a huge difference. Now, how would you interpret that huge difference? Some even try to accuse the latter of uh, giving misinformation. But what do you make of those differences? I don't have any inside information about who did what, but it's clear that in China, the outbreak started in one city, probably a transmission event or a small number of transmission events occurring in Wuhan. And that meant that once China cracked down on Wuhan, despite the fact that several people had left, mm. it really was a chance to control the outbreak. In the U.S., it appears that the outbreak occurred simultaneously or near simultaneously in many cities, probably by uh, resulting from people traveling from an area that already had it to the U.S. And there were many, many introductions. There's evidence that in New York it was introduced by several different times and much more harder to control there that way, especially at a time when there was little or no testing. Uh, Dr. Rubin, having said that, though, tell me more about what is going on with the testing because at the very beginning uh, the U.S. has been talking about massive testing. Until today, what is the scale? Uh, it depends on where you are. Yes. I think uh, the availability of testing varies from place to place. Uh, we haven't had a lot of testing at the federal level, at the national level, and it's really relied on states and, and cities to work up the capacity to uh, test at very large scale. That and commercial providers. The commercial providers have been scaling up and in certain localities like San Francisco, like uh, Boston, where there are a large academic community, the academic community has pitched in as well. But are there enough tests even in a place like Boston? No, there still aren't enough, but it has been improving um, and it's much better in certain places than others. It will continue to improve. We're not where we need to be yet. Uh, a lot of testing in much of the country comes from commercial providers, and they need to get tests in place and um, validated and then uh, work up their manufacturing capacity. Mm -hmm. They're doing it. It is taking, it's taking a while. Is there a timetable with which testing needs to take place so that the U.S. will be able to get on track with its uh, rep uh, you know, productions and manufacturing and things like that? Well, that's a slightly complicated answer. Optimally, we should have all that testing in place before we start, before we start opening up our social distancing policies. Uh, realistically, will that happen? I'm not sure. It mm -hmm. depends on leadership issues. Another thing is about the PPE. I mean, you yourself work in the hospital over the past week besides your job as the editor-in-chief of New England Journal of Medicine. So you know what was it like to be on the front line and lack of PPE. Now, on this program, I've been talking to 
medical workers from around the world on that issue, but U.S. seems to have a very big one still today. What happened? I can say that it's gotten better, but it's not where we'd want it to be. Mm. Uh, we, we have to think about how to use our PPE better now instead of just having enough so that everyone has, has them all the time, anytime they want them. Another question, Dr. Rubin. Your magazine, you yourself have been uh, working on the story about the origin of the virus and further studies of the virus. Uh, recently, we see the news uh, from the state of California tracing back uh, two earlier death cases. One is February the 6th and the other is February the 17th and confirmed as COVID-19. Now, the state of California is doing further investigation about the cases even dating back to December last year. We don't now know the result yet, but tell me more about what this could mean because Earlier, the U.S. first death case was supposed to be the one in the state of Washington uh, at the end of February. Now, we seem to move one month earlier than the original copy. So, I don't know any of the details of the California cases that you're mm -hmm. uh, talking about. Uh, not anything more than what I've read in the newspaper. It would not be surprising at all if there were introductions earlier than we than the one in Seattle. I, I, I just don't find that surprising. What it means is that those introductions didn't result in big clusters and a lot of transmission, though. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have seen that because we would have seen those outbreaks. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly true that there's a lot of disease out there that we're missing. We already talked about asymptomatic infection, which is probably happening at reasonably high rates. In fact, the few case spots that have been looked at in the US for example, around here in nursing homes, if you go in and find cases in nursing homes, people are sick, and go and test everybody, you'll find often that a majority of the residents have been infected, have current infection, and yet are asymptomatic. So we know that happens at a great rate.